if you follow the link that's on here, I don't know if it's even legible, so let me see if I can... So anyway, in this link, it's uh, an example of a, um, a, a chaining procedure, so let's take a look at it. Okay, so this is a visual stimulus of the types of sh basically a chain of what's going on. So he's showing you how that whole chain is developed. Right? So what he's got is a big chunk of wood here, right? It don't really matter what type of wood it is. Um, in fact, he takes you through a procedure for how do you get the wood to that status anyway. Right? So what he's doing is he's shaping it out here first. He's kind of making the bottom of that bowl, right? And then um, this is just called roughing in, right? So he's just roughing in the general shape of the bowl. So you can read through this if you want. Um, so you can see here that the shavings are coming off. You can see what he's doing. He's, this is the bottom of the, believe it or not, it's the bottom of the bowl. Right? Kind of hard to see. You can see it in this picture how it's kind of developing, right? So you can see that roundness that's showing up in here. This picture it's really bad. He's just kind of showing the grain and showing where some of the problems are. Um, but <clears throat> what you also see here is um, he's got this little flat spot, and that becomes important for learning how to use the tool, but um, we'll get back to that here in a minute. Um, Again, he's just rounding this thing off and making the bottom of the bowl. A little bit more detail, he's adding that shape. You can see how that shape's starting to develop here, right? So you, the, the shape of the bowl, um, well done, using lots of safety equipment. That's a, <laughs> that's a shaped response, I'll tell you that much. But look at the wood that's coming off here. So he's doing a lot of work. He's getting that shape, and it's, it's turning really nice. So there's that flat spot we were looking at earlier. He's actually doing some things in there to make it easier for when he gets to doing the other side of the bowl, the inside of the bowl. Um, so he's, again, the picture's kind of hard to see, but here we go. Um, as you can see what's happened, that started out as just a big round, now he's created that bowl. And there's this little flat spot down here that we keep talking about. He's going to flip that around and use that on the other side. So now he flips it around, right? This whole thing gets flipped, and this flat spot gets attached to this side of the lathe, and now he's going to start cutting the inside of that bowl out. He's got a special tool for doing that, and it's a cool tool, but what he's doing is slowly cutting the inside of the bowl out, and now with this cut, this removal tool, he has um, popped out this big center section, and this removal tool saves the wood so you can do another bowl out of it later, so it just removes this big chunk out of it. Right? So now he's got the big chunk out, and he's cleaning up the inside of the bowl. Okay, so that's that, and there you go. So that's that whole chain. Those are all those steps. But there's a lot of individual behaviors involved in those steps. And with this type of thing, it's actually learned from a forward chaining perspective and because you have to start at the beginning. You really can't start at the end with this. You have to have, you have to, you have to make the bowl before you can finish the bowl, you know, so that type of thing. So there's an example of chaining for you. So. All right, factors affecting chaining. Number one, task analysis. Make sure you've done a good one. Every possible step you can possibly think of should be in your task analysis. Sometimes you can skip some tasks, but you need all of them in there right off the bat. Right? Develop cues to help guide mastery of that chain. Right? Are there visual cues? Are there written cues? Are there visual cues? Are there self-instructions? What, you know, what are those procedures? You know, The guy that's building the bowl, there's probably a lot of self-instruction going on. Right? Um, he put the instructions on the web page for a visual prompt for somebody else, right? So you've got that visual prompt. You can go back to it and look, right? And say, oh, I know what I need to be doing next. I'm going to be building my tenon so I can grab it and then, and then start turning the inside of the bowl. Self-instructions. He's The guy in there is probably telling himself, oh, okay, i got to smooth this out. Oh, okay, I'm going to remove the centerpiece. Oh, okay, I'm going to do the tenon or whatever, you know? Um, but it's self-instructions, right? So lots of cues make the make chaining easier. Um, if you can, model the chain while describing the steps. So put on your pants, or uh, that's kind of a bad example, put on your shirt or something if you're teaching somebody how to put on a shirt, or if you're turning a bowl, right, like that guy was, uh, when I teach woodworking stuff, I do an example and describe what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Now I don't do big lathe work like that, but I do small lathe work, and I've taught people how to turn pens and um, make other things like bottle stoppers and goofy little things like that. And the idea is as I'm doing it, I'm telling them what I'm going through. I'm telling them, I'm verbalizing those self-instructions and kind of teaching them each step and then giving them those self-instructions that I use along the way, as well as modeling what to do. Um, if you're trying to teach someone else, you often provide a verbal prompt. Uh, for example, I was teaching a guy, I was teaching a group of people, Really, uh, re somewhat recently, to do some, to uh, to make a uh, 
Well, let's see how many of them chose. A couple of them chose a French style rolling pin, and another one chose an American style rolling pin. And they're, if you're not into baking, that makes no <laughs> it makes no sense to you. If you are into baking, you're like, oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. But the idea is that I was teaching people how to make rolling pins, and I've made French style or American style, and I prefer the French. So I told the guys, hey, I prefer you do a French, but it's up to you and what type of uh, rolling pin that you want. And so what I did was I put the chain on the board. So here's the things you need to do. Here's the steps we're going to need to take. Here's how you flatten this piece. Here's how you make this handle. Here's how you do X, Y, and Z, right? But um, sometimes they would get stuck and they'd just be sitting there looking at the at the, um, the rolling pin going, oh, I don't exactly know what's going on with this. I'm kind of stuck. And I'd provide a verbal prompt and I would say, handle next. So, or, um, or finger spaces. Right? So finger spaces are on an American style rolling pin. You get a little handle that's on the edge, right? So you need a spot for your fingers to go um, so it doesn't you know, crush the pie dough with your fingers, right? Um, so you've uh, so you got to have those finger spaces in there. So I would prompt them with that finger space stuff. Say, okay, don't forget to measure your finger spaces and get room for that and gouge out those areas first um, and then finish out your handle, right? So you would provide a verbal prompt. If they do something wrong, then you would typically want to move them back a step. And, and that got a little hard. You know, I ran into that problem with uh, the having people make a rolling pin because one guy made a big mistake and ruined his rolling pin. So he had to back up from the beginning, which that was a big problem because it took like a day to get to where he was at. He screwed it up and ruined the whole thing. But we had to back it up, right? So we had to move back a step until that link was completed accurately. And he did. He eventually got it. He came back in the next day and went. You know, we continued training one on one, and he got through it the second time. And he finally succeeded and was able to finish out that rolling pin the way he wanted to. Okay. Fade out extra steps as quickly as possible. That way, the natural reinforcers take over. Right? It makes the chain completely natural. It makes it stronger. It makes it not dependent on other cues. You know, I get the pet peeve is um, GPSs. <laughs> I love GPSs. They're great. You know, the sat nav stuff, right? They're awesome. They make it really easy, but they also make you completely dependent upon them. Because if you're used to using one, that's all you're going to use. You don't have to memorize the city streets. You don't have to memorize the layout of a town. You don't have to memorize how to get from uh, 456 Southeast Place up to, um, you know, I don't know what other, some other, up to Military Avenue or whatever over in Seattle. I can't remember the name of it, but... Uh, I'm just thinking of an example of how I used to have to drive over there. But uh, with a with a GPS, you just listen to what it tells you. It's basically giving you all the chains and giving you all these prompts. Make left or you know, turn left in 500 meters, you know, or however it says its little thing. Um, or keep left and keep right and keep left to make a right and all those things. And you just follow those little stupid little commands. But you never learn how to do it on your own. Uh, and so fading out those cues as quickly as you can is an important thing. Get rid of those extra steps and then you learn how to do it on your own.